Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopez, and today I'm joined by Dr. Kyle Thomas. He received his PhD in experimental psychology from Harvard University, where he developed his research program on the psychology of common knowledge under his advisor, Steven Pinker. And today we're going to talk about that, the psychology of common knowledge. So Dr. Thomas, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to everyone. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. Love your show. <laughs> Great. Okay, so uh, let's start perhaps with some basics here, with some definitions, because I would imagine that people who are not familiar with the sort of literature on common knowledge are not that well versed on the kinds of things we're going to talk about here, and maybe they will confuse some of it. So just to make things clear here, could you tell us, first of all, what is private knowledge from a social psychology perspective? Yeah, sure. So I, I think I'd actually like to start the other direction and start with common knowledge and then work my way okay. back. Okay, fair I enough. I think it's yeah. more clear. So um, to start off, the definition of common knowledge that we're going to be talking about is it's a technical game theoretic definition. And it's actually kind of confusing because the word common knowledge has this other meaning, which is super annoying on my Google news alerts, which is, you know, it is common knowledge X, Y, or Z. That's sort of, I mean, it's related, but that's not specifically what we're talking about. So common knowledge in the technical sense is an infinite state of recursive beliefs or knowledge states. So for example, I know X, I know that you know X, I know that you know that I know X, I know that you know that I know that you know, and, and you know, you can keep on going. So yeah. common knowledge is sort of the limit of all levels of knowledge or, you know, uh, the intuition that we have more is like something's public, right? Like we're both looking at the same thing. We both know each other, can see it and so on. Um, from there, sort of the opposite extreme is as we define it in the paper, and this is, you know, common knowledge has a well-defined sort of formal definition. Private knowledge is more like we needed a contrast. So it's sort of an operational definition, but basically it's knowledge that you might have that has no other element of theory of mind. Like you're not thinking about what other people know. So for example, I know the sky is blue. Now I might know that other people know that, but that's just a fact of nature or, you know, at knowing things without that sort of layer of like, am I even thinking about whether you know, right? And there's a lot of things like that, that you can add those layers, but you don't necessarily have them, right? Like you might know some math proof or something. Um, and then shared knowledge as we define it is basically anything in between. So it's some level of recursive knowledge. I know that you know X, but without going sort of all the way up. And, you know, so there has the theory of mind component, but it's basically anything short of common knowledge. And the reason why we break it into these three broad categories is I think the distinction between common knowledge and private knowledge is probably pretty straightforward, but this distinction in the middle with shared knowledge, um, I, I just want to clarify because I, it's one, it's hard for us to represent as you get like many levels deep. Like I know that you know that I know, and we lump them together for a few reasons. So like all the different intermediate states, where you know technically there's like infinite of them, right? Like I could know that you know that I know, and then um, you know following, and this is generally the convention, we try and give them some label of like k levels up, right? So like secondary, right? Like I know that you know something, but like you, I, I don't know if you know that I know that you know. Right. You know tertiary would be I know that you know that I know, and, and so on. So you can kind of hit different levels um, on the way up, and. So I'll, I'll stop there. I mean, those are the basic definitions that I'll, I'll be using. Mm -hmm. So we've already defined private knowledge, shared knowledge, common knowledge. But in the case of common knowledge, uh, I mean, does it necessarily have to be shared between more than two people or can it be just two people? Yeah, so that's a really good question. It can be just two. In fact, in a lot of our experiments, they were with dyads, so there were only two people involved. Um, there, I'm, you know, there is like in-person common knowledge, and that's we allude to a lot of sort of hypotheses that fall out of this analysis, like, you know, mass protest, for example, that has to have some element of like in-person, you know, everybody knows that everybody knows, but yeah, it can be all the way down just to two people, as simple as that. 
Mm -hmm. But you analyze the, those different sorts of situations with different air number and numbers of people. I mean, through the lens of game theory in different ways, right? I mean, it's not exactly the same common knowledge between two people and three people and four people and so on. Sure. Absolutely. And just to clarify, I'm not a game theorist. Like I don't write the math proofs. I'm using the, you know, I'm using the math in order to derive predictions about, you know, what evolutionary psychologists would call like a task analysis, right? So here's the nature of a problem in the world. Game theory gives us a, a decent specification of different types of social sort of problems or structures, right? Like reciprocal altruism has a game theoretic sort of framework. Um, and so I, I'm not as deep in all of the, I mean, this literature goes pretty far and gets pretty obscure in the, right. in the formal sense. So I, first off, just to be clear, I'm not formalizing any of this. These are not my models. I'm using, you know, real experts in game theory as, you know, models to help understand what we might expect to see in the human mind. And then we're doing experiments and sort of theorizing off of that. So to answer your question, we have not come up with any kind of formalization of, you know, N person. However, you know, in our, in our first paper in the, um, the, it was 2014, it was the psychology of coordination and common knowledge. We did do, you know, experiment one was a dyad, experiment two was four people. And while the pattern of results was the same, it, like the, the general trend was the same, it was sort of more attenuated for four. So like people were less likely to cooperate if it had to involve three other people as opposed to just one other person, which I think seems relatively intuitive, right? It's harder to kind of coordinate with more people than with fewer people. But the overall, the sort of the, the intuitions and the decisions, at least as far as we've measured them, seem very similar. Um, but there is some sort of like scaling of, you know, 10 people's harder than one person and, you know, 100 people's harder still. So, yeah. So I want to ask you about specific examples of if a social phenomena that the psychology of common knowledge allows for us to have a better understanding of. But just before we get into some of those illustrative examples, let me just ask you generally. So what are the sort of social phenomena that uh, by studying common knowledge, we, we get a better grasp of? Yeah, yeah, great question. And actually, it's a great place to start before we even go into all the examples is there's a sort of very general way you can think about this and approach this. And that is, um, and, and again, this will be sort of abstract, but then we'll, we'll see how that abstraction applies, you know, across all these different domains and sort of how we got there. Um, so first off, just defining um, what's known as a coordination game in game theory. So in a coordinate, so in, in game theory, it's basically the mathematics of interacting agents, right? What's my best move given, you know, that I'm anticipating your move. And technically speaking, a coordination problem is a game in which there are multiple pure Nash equilibria. So putting that, you know, making that concrete and, and less sort of abstract, basically it's a scenario where you have a set of choices and I have a set of choices and there are multiple combinations in which neither of us, like, neither of us benefits from deviating from it. So simple example, we could all drive on the right side of the street, we could all drive on the left side of the street. That's two equilibria. The main thing that matters is you wanna do what everyone else is doing so you don't get into a car crash. And in fact, you know, across countries, they've solved in different ways, right? Like in Great Britain, they drive on, you know, other side of the street. So yeah. that's a very simple example of two equilibria. Everyone drives on the right, everyone drives on the left, and no one has any incentive to deviate as long as that's what other people are. So that's a, a coordination problem. And the key part here is um, multiple equilibria. So we have multiple options in which we both benefit from landing on one of them, but not discoordinating. So it would be terrible if you drove on the right, I drove on the left and we got into a car accident, right? So um, there's sort of multiple options and that's where the role of common knowledge is very important. So. Um, basically in game theory, their common knowledge, it, it sort of, it plays a role in, in a lot of areas, but usually it's sort of a footnote, right? So like, if you read a lot of the literature and you read the experimental papers, they'll make sure, for example, that the rules of the public goods game are common knowledge, right? So that there's no confusion there. So 
common knowledge in most areas of game theory, it's basically an assumption to kind of get you off the ground and say, okay, well, you know, everyone knows the, the same set of things. And so now I can predict your behavior because I know that you're, you know, we're all seeing the same thing. In contrast, in coordination games, it's the one area where it plays more of a functional role. So it's not just like table setting to get the model to work. It's actually, it has consequences within the model. And in particular, and there's a number of different sort of ways of looking at this and dissecting it, but the sort of simplest way of thinking about it is if you want to switch coordination equilibria, common knowledge is in certain scenarios required. Um, it, it's not always required. So there's other ways you can, you know, like you could do a follow the leader, right? So first I start driving, you know, we're all driving on the left, then I start driving on the right, and then you, you also respond. So it's not the only way to, to switch equilibria, but especially if you're trying to do it sort of simultaneously, um, and a lot of the sort of more colorful examples we use are, you know, the Arab Spring, there's a focal point, a man in Tunisia lights himself on fire, that's public, that creates that sort of end person common knowledge, and all of a sudden you go from sort of everybody tolerating the regime to a, a full uprising, right? And so that kind of equilibria shift where no one wants to be the only one in the uprising, right? Because you get shot or thrown in jail. Um, but at the same time, they, you know, they might prefer it. But in order to get there, you need some catalyzing event. And I think we see a lot of that actually in sort of like momentous historical events where, um, you know, the metaphor of like a powder keg. And then there's some event that strikes and all of a sudden everything changes like that, right? And that to me is very much a sort of signature of like one of these equilibrium shifts, right? We all go from docilely following the regime to we're all protesting at 5 p.m. in Tahrir Square, right? So that would be like a straightforward kind of example there. Mm -hmm. A common knowledge also plays a role in how people play economic games, right? Like, for example, the ultimatum game, the the prisoner dilemma game, right? And others like that. Yeah, so good question. Um, and this, again, I, 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 so a lot of the work that I've done and a lot of the more formal components of it, I've, I've done a lot with uh, Moshe Hoffman, who is a game theorist, does write proofs. And so, like I said, I, I claim no expertise on being able to model out the, you know, real analysis, set theory kind of ways that this stuff is usually described. But well enough to understand it and well enough to, you know, interact and have this dialogue to where I can get, you know, sort of the predictions out as opposed to just the math model. And the way he's described it is, it's pretty free, straightforward to show that the only type of game in which you, like, common knowledge can have this functional role as opposed to an assumption is some kind of coordination game. You need multiple equilibria for it to matter, right? So going back to what a coordination game is. And so, right, a prisoner's dilemma right? It does show up there. And on its face, a prisoner's dilemma isn't a coordination problem, right? There is one dominant equilibrium, and that's we both defect, right? However, an iterated prisoner's dilemma does become a kind of coordination problem when you look at it in the like global sense of it. And so what we found, so first off, you're absolutely right, it shows up in economic games. I mean, it's all, you know, it's sort of the same area. And it's just how you define, you know, which types of economic games. So like the ultimatum game, and I think there's some interesting uh, bits in throughout like some of our other work that doesn't address the ultimatum game specifically, but touches on components of where you might see that it matters. So the, the sort of, I think most straightforward explanation of what people are doing in the ultimatum game, I offer you some money, you reject it outright. You, like you're worse off, I'm worse off, everyone, you know, and the only thing really there to benefit is your reputation. And so there's an element where it can matter. And going back to what I was saying about, you know, coordination problems are the only place common knowledge matters. So the, the, the whole research agenda has gone, it goes bi-directional, which means on the one hand, we can identify that there is a coordination problem. So for example, this was in our research on the bystander effect, we actually sort of was like, hey, that looks like an anti-coordination an anti problem, which we can get into. So common knowledge should matter, but we didn't actually know. Um, there, it was more like, oh, the, like we see coordination, so this thing should be important. Alternatively, there's 
a whole other sort of like the other direction where intuitively we kind of sense that common knowledge matters, right? Um, and I think actually some of the emotional stuff was more based on the intuition that sort of my, you know, my intuitions are things are more embarrassing if, you know, everyone's looking at me than if we can all kind of pretend it didn't happen. Um, so in those kinds of scenarios, we do find common knowledge matters, but then basically we go hunting for the coordination problem. Like, okay, great. So if it matters and it only really matters for these scenarios, then what is the sort of, um, you know, a coordination problem is very abstract, right? It could apply to how words get definitions, how we drive on streets, like social arrangement. I mean, it could apply to all kinds of stuff. So what's the actual content there that has that kind of a form? And like with the self-conscious emotions, you know, we're arguing it has to do with basically relationship management and like damage control and a number of these other components that, for example, Daniel Snyder has done a great job kind of illustrating the functional role. And I know we'll get to it, but back to the ultimatum game, you've got reputation on the line. And in a sense, reputation is also a form of common knowledge because if you have like, it, it plays a role in third parties coordinating to uh, for you, against you and so on, right? So like if you're, I don't know, take, it, and actually all the cancel culture stuff is great as like these like funny little, well, not fun, I mean, they're sad, but you know, examples of, um, you know, Jeffrey Tubin, for example, not great. And now his reputation is, is terrible, even though people might say, well, like it was an accident, you know, he didn't really mean to do it. And so just agreeing on the reputation itself has this kind of coordination component. And I think that's where, that's where I would predict that any of those effects would come in in the ultimatum game. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about some of the examples you gave there. Uh, what are self-conscious emotions and what is the relationship between them and common knowledge? Yeah, great question. So um, this was a, one of our projects where we have both, you know, we got sort of survey data and then we got lab data. The self-conscious emotions, it's a fuzzy category. So, you know, depending on who you ask, it's, you know, four or five, six. Um, but basically they're the emotions that, again, you'll, you'll, you'll sort of feel them intuitively, right? So embarrassment, shame, guilt, and pride are really the canonical ones. I think sometimes people put envy in there. Um, so there's a couple others, but basically it's emotions that more or less have you as like a social agent in the thing, right? And like in the model, right? Like I could be happy without anyone else being around. I can even be mad without anyone else being around, but in order to feel shame, like at least it, like mentally I'm representing some people or like, it, it, so it's a, it's a social emotion really. Um, and, and I think, you know, the way I would look at it and again, it sort of the Best work, I best recent work I know of on this, you know, Jessica Tracy sort of built up the long literature and then Daniel Snyder and colleagues have really taken that and run with it and, and put it on sort of a functional adaptive kind of uh, foundation in, in recent research over the last decade or so showing a lot of sort of the actual logic underlying all of this. Um, and so how do we find it there? More or less it was an intuition and in fact, uh, the way Steve brought it up to me, uh, Steve Pinker brought it up to me when we were talking was he said, he mentioned there was some old commercial where like everyone's sitting there and all of a sudden, you know, it goes like, oh, Brian? And the whole room sort of, you know, flips around and is staring at him and he's like, and even just watching it, like you could feel it, you know? And, and the second you start thinking about it, you're like, oh yeah, it is totally like embarrassing. And I think we've all had moments, you know, like a really um, sort of, uh, delicate like an easy example is like you trip and fall and you kind of try and like recover your step and hope nobody noticed um things like that so really that started as an intuition and then in the paper we have on it we had to build out well if it matters then, then where's the coordination problem and i think it's really about um relationships maintaining relationships which the where we get to the coordination part is a tie-in with the fact that it seems, and this is based on work by Alan Fisk and, and others on relational models, it seems as though we have sort of discrete types of relationship, right? Like we can be friends or we can be lovers. Um, you could be my boss and coworker. And there's a lot on this sort of out there more broadly. So I won't go into 
sort of all the all the details. But I, to me, the the way I make sense of it is, you have conflicting sort of grammar to those relationships between the two, right? So if we're if you know if we're market exchange partners, I, I can haggle with you. I can pay you the fair price for the car. If we're friends, that's not really kosher. And if I start doing that, it's like, well, what kind of friend are you? You know, you. Is it, What's this with my welfare trade-off ratio that you're doing, and and so on and so on. So, I think that the the coordination component there is it's it, it's the relationship type. Basically, are we friends? Are we lovers? You know, are we enemies? Are we sort of whatever? And that is what we're regulating a lot with the social emotions. In addition to you know, there's whole other layers on top of that, but that's the component of it that is related to common knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, so in this case, could it be that self-conscious emotions evolved in response to our need to establish or regulate this sort of coordinated behaviors that we find in our human societies and our and the kinds of relationships we establish with one another? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and again, I'll point you to the work of Daniel Snyder and colleagues who've just been on a tear with this. I know you've you've talked to them before, so. Yeah. I've been on the show, I'm sure listeners are familiar. Um, but what's what's really interesting, so in terms of sort of like the social regulation and, and all these other components, one other, so A, yes, I agree. I think that the function of these is basically managing our social environments and networks in various ways, whether, you know, there's work that like blushing can serve more or less like an apology, like some sort of on a signal for an apology or, you know, shame, you know, blind people do it and see it in Jessica Tracy's work. I mean, it, it, it's pretty consistent, but the one thing that also really stands out and we, we sort of have one little, a one line hy hypothesis of this early, right? When we had like, here's 38 things we can think of where this, this might matter. What's interesting about the self-conscious emotions is if you think about all of the sort of canonical um, emotional displays, so like think about like the Ekman, you know, the, the basic emotions, right? Happiness, sadness, and so on. Most of those emotions, the indicators are on the face, right? Which is important, our face clearly, and there's all kinds of work on, you know, our face evolved as in part as a communicative mechanism, right? And, and the way that we perceive faces and so on. But what's interesting is the self-conscious emotions, they, it's almost like they go beyond the face. So, you know, the prototypical pride display, arms up, right? You can mm -hmm. see that from, like, everyone can see that. So if you're behind me, you still know, like, I think I, my reputation just got a boost, right? Shame, you know, shoulders slumped, almost like you're trying to hide. Embarrassment with the, with blushing in particular. Um, we, we sort of left this as an open thread. Again, I don't know enough about the sort of physiology across, you know, populations of blushing, but given the, the fact that it is basically automatic, and in fact, you know, we try not to do it, right? And yet still it, it comes out and there's work on it sort of serving as some sort of a, like a apology signal of like, hey, I screwed up, you know, I'm aware of it, I won't do it again. Um, all of those strike me very much as like, they're probably like that for a reason, which is they're related to this. Whereas if, if I'm angry, I mean, I could just stare you down and that, you know, that can be like intimidating to you. And I actually don't care necessarily if you know that I know that you know that I'm angry as long as you, you know, adjust things in certain, and it, like, again, the, like depending on the context, if we're friends and I'm angry, there's probably a coordination component, but like, if I'm just, you know, on the street driving and someone pisses me off and I give them some anger face, I probably just want them to go away. Right. I don't really care about our future relationship. So. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's talk about now the example of charitable behavior. So, uh, what aspects of charitable behavior can we understand better by applying the psychology of common knowledge? I mean, in terms of why people perform charitable behavior and how other people evaluate it. Yeah, it's, it's a really good question. And we have a paper that, um, I don't know, it's one of these like 14 experiments to kind of thread apart, like titrate it and all these other different things. And where the paper started was... Um, the old Talmudic scholar, uh, I can't say his name, and Steve makes fun of me, By Maimonides, right, who had yeah. I don't know, like 11, 1100s or whatever, he has his, his ladder of like charitability. And, you know, in the eight steps or whatever 
a number of them are sort of irrelevant to our theories. They're probably relevant to other theories, like in-groupishness, right? Like it's more helpful to, like it's better to help a Jewish person than not. That's very groupish kind of thing. But there is a series of these steps and we sort of focus on four that seem to map onto this like private knowledge, shared knowledge, common knowledge. And they are in sort of that expected hierarchy of that, like what I would think intuitively is like, okay, if it's common knowledge, my charitable thing is is less charitable and we all have that intuition right i mean people gotten in trouble for like oh you know he's just giving the the university 50 million dollars to name the gym after him right and that's sort of looked down upon as oh you're just doing it for the status um so that's definitely sort of the least charitable and what what we think and this is what we're kind of titrating in in that experiment is a lot of this goes back to partner choice right so it's there's two elements of it one is if I wanna coordinate to bestow benefits on you with like other people, right? I think Bill Gates is doing great work with the Gates Foundation or not. And right, so that there's, I think there's an element of that, um, but the, sorry, I totally lost my train of thought. Let's go. <laughs> uh, we, we were talking about charitable behavior and you were mentioning uh, Gates and so on. Yes. Yeah, so what was interesting that we found that actually we didn't expect. So we started with the Maimonides ladder. Mm -hmm. And what was interesting was sort of in general, it does follow this like common knowledge is seen as less charitable. And then the other thing we're asking is, is about the partner choice stuff specifically is, you know, is this person likely to give in the future? Right. So that's sort of what I was getting after is it's almost like you're trying to use past behavior to predict future behavior. And so the context of that past behavior matters, right? And if it's, you just did it to get the accolades and get your name on a gym, I'm much, that, that doesn't make as good of a partner as if you just gave $50 million out of the goodwill of your heart because it, it, it's more predictive that you would help me in the future if you, you know, did the latter. What was interesting was we didn't get the exact breakdown as predicted, right? Which is the shared knowledge and private knowledge didn't necessarily it wasn't all just rank order, like you see with all the coordination stuff. And there was a whole set of experiments we did in the middle to try and understand that. And in particular, I think it had to do a bit with like exactly how my Maimonides specified these levels that we kind of tried to capture. And one was, it's like the donor gives to the recipient and the donor knows who the recipient is, but the recipient doesn't know who the donor is. Right. And then you, you can also have sort of the reverse, like I, you know, donate anonymously, but actually the donor finds out, you know, who I am. Right. So you can think of like, I was think of like those programs for funding, you know, like anti-poverty programs in Africa where, you know, you adopt a, a child or something and you know who they are, but maybe they don't know. So I think a lot of that was sort of playing on these intuitions. And what was interesting was it wasn't just like a nice clean, like, oh, the more you know, the less charitable it is, or the more people know, the less charitable it is. And when we went back, we were trying to tease this apart and we think it has something to do. And I, I think there's definitely room for even more research on exactly these mechanisms. But I basically think some of the other social intuitions around reciprocity were getting pulled in. So if I give to you, right, but I know who you are, but you don't know who I am, there's sort of this indirect reciprocity, there's expectations there, and vice versa. If you know who I am, so I give anonymously, but like, and, and it was also sort of in the way that that, that it, it's framed, it's like, I want you to know who I am, but I don't care if I know who you are. It seemed like there were intuitions around, oh, it's like a direct reciprocity, like, you know, and this, you, you see this across the anthro literature where often people will give gifts and they're not always uh, happy to receive them because they entail an obligation that comes out of our sort of reciprocity uh, intuitions. I think that's what's going on in the middle layers that it's a combination of the reputational component, which is kind of where we had been focusing, and then to untangle why it's not just a straight linear effect, right? As the, as the knowledge goes up, I think it's because there's other elements that are being considered about social obligation. And in particular, we tried to pick apart a little bit um, whether, you know, direct reciprocity, indirect, th things like that. Mm -hmm. But do we know why people donate anonymously? I mean, do they get any sort of benefit from that, social benefit? 
Yeah, no, it, it's a great question. Um, I don't have a great answer for you. Um, and I think, you know, probably some of the more interesting work in this is um, being done like in the effective altruism area, right? Where they're trying to kind of figure out what are the, the sort of intuitive handles to grab onto to improve charity and so on. Yeah. Um, I will say uh, Oliver Curry, he got contacted by, I, I don't know if you remember Cecil the Lion? Yes, I do, yeah. So Cecil the Lion, um, right, it was a big public event, clearly like a common knowledge generator, right? Um, and there was a group, and I don't remember the details, I'm, you know, I'm sure I could ask him, but, but there was some group that reached out to him and said, hey, look, we've been raising money to save the lions for decades. We have never seen anything like the flood of money that came in from Cecil the lion, right? And so while that doesn't necessarily get directly to your question of like, why would people give anonymously? It clearly shows that there's sort of like a component of this when it's one common knowledge, right? So that Cecil the lion being common knowledge and that it could be anonymous, right? So this this doesn't necessarily get directly to your question, but it's a sort of a, no, a sort of notable instance where charity and common knowledge really have this sort of important combination. In terms of the anonymity, um, my general sense of this, and it's not something that I've researched in, like I haven't researched anonymity in, in a ton of depth, right? We're much more interested in like knowledge levels and these in, in these sort of more limited interactions. But so, for example, why would someone bestow a $50 million anonymous gift to their, you know, their, their old university or something, and nobody knows who it is, and they don't want anyone to know who it is. My sense is, is it's basically the, it's the same sort of psychology that we're, that we're looking at, which is, it's all about partner choice. So like, really, like, if I want to be cynical about it, and that's sort of like, how do I maximize my benefits from being charitable? Really, what I want to do is I want to make it seem like I didn't want anyone to know, and then I want everyone to find out, right? So like yeah. a sort of cynical take would be I, I donate anonymously and then I leak it to the press. I mean, like classic, I don't know, it's not like Don, some Donald Trump would do. Um, and I think that those are part of the intuitions that are driving it. Um, again, I don't, I don't know, and I don't know like all the factors that go into anonymous, different kinds of anonymous donations and things like that. I will say we do know it's much less common um, and less frequent and sort of the, these, these having other people know that you did nice things is definitely a strong incentive to do them. And if you remove that, you have less incentive, but people still do it. And I think it goes back sort of loosely speaking to something like honest signaling, right? Like if I really am the kind of person that just donates money and I'm committed to it, then I don't want anyone to know Then I'm probably a really nice person. And even if you don't observe my donation directly, I'm the kind of person in which you would see that type of behavior generally, right? So this would tie back to other areas of game theory, like um, like commitment problems that Schelling talks about, right? And sort of the, the inverse of that, of like, you know, or my my sort of what, where where I would take this is, um, you know, the application of Schelling. Uh, sorry, I'm just rattling off names. So. Thomas Schelling, 1960, talks a lot about this problem of, of commitment problems, right? Which is how we got to sort of mutually assured destruction, right? Um, and in essence, the way that you solve a commitment problem is you, well, there's a, there's a few ways, but the best way, and this goes back to the bystander research, is like the game of chicken is one type of commitment problem. Well, it's an anti coordinate well, hold on. Let, 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 me, let me stop and back up. So a commitment problem, Let's say that New York is going to nuke Moscow. Moscow is going to bomb New York. They each have this choice to face, and it's, you know, time one, day one. New York doesn't want to bomb Moscow because Moscow will likely retaliate and bomb New York, so they're worse off, right? Mm -hmm. Moscow doesn't want to bomb New York because, you know, New York might retaliate, and then they're worse off. So given that incentive, though, on day two, let's say Moscow does bomb New York, well, now New York is faced with exactly the same dilemma as day one. Like, even though they've gotten bombed, if you just look at, like, what's the state today? It's, well, we could bomb Moscow and risk more retaliation, or we could not and, you know, cut our losses. And so because you never really advanced that, right, 
and sort of thinking like, you know, in the sort of like three steps ahead kind of game theory logic, Moscow now has an incentive to bomb New York because they know that once they have done it, there's actually no incentive to bomb them back, right? And so that's the logic of a commitment problem. And, and so in some way, the way you get out of these is, you know, the, the sort of Cold War theories of mutually assured destruction, with like the best example being, you know, Dr. Strangelove, if, if you've seen it, which yeah. brilliant capture of exactly this. And there's two components you need to solve this. And, and don't worry, this comes back to the, the coordination stuff. So there's two components that you need to solve the coordination problem. One is, uh, and, and this is really a thesis sort of shelling developed a bit in the strategy of conflict in 1960 in a general like international relations way. And then Robert Frank picked up in his amazing book, Passions Within Reason, to say, actually, this is the logic that underlies like why emotions put us out of control. And the paradoxical logic of these commitment problems is, you can put it a couple of cute ways, but one way is being out of control puts you in control, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, this is why, for example, you know, the Normans invade England and they burn their ships behind them. That's a commitment. They're, they couldn't go back if they wanted to. And in Dr. Strangelove, right, at, sort of towards the end, you know, the Russians have built this doomsday machine and he's there and he, they, they walk him through the logic. Well, yeah, if we ever get bombed, it's gonna explode the whole planet. And he sees the, like, the deterrence commitment aspect of it. Oh, that's brilliant. He goes, why didn't you tell us? And they're like, oh, we we're gonna tell you on Tuesday. And the other key piece is you have some kind of commitment that you can't deviate from, but you also have to signal that to the other person or the other party so that they are aware of it and don't bomb you and then blow up the world. So, how do you win a game of chicken, right? You know, the game of chicken, drive two cars driving in the first one that swerves, right? Mm -hmm. Like worst case scenario, you crash, right? But really for me, my best case scenario is you swerve and I keep going, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you win a game of chicken? You cut off your steering wheel and you hold it out the window. You basically signal, I couldn't swerve if I wanted to. And here's the proof, right? So that's the sort of commitment element of it. And then that's sort of what, uh, you know, Robert Frank ties into a lot of the emotions more broadly, like why you'd fall, fly into a jealous rage and all these other things that seem against our own interests. I suspect getting all the way back to your question about anonymous giving, I suspect there's an element of that sort of commitment logic. Like I couldn't help but donate even if I wanted to. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, let's talk about uh, another thing that you've already mentioned several times, the bystander effect. So before we get into the details about how we can, you, how we can understand it better through the psychology of common knowledge, is it a real effect? I mean, has it been replicated? Yeah, so I, I, I'm guessing you're referring to some of the older studies back in the 60s that seemed a bit questionable. Is that... Yeah, but yeah, exactly. Because recently there have been some studies and articles out questioning some of those early studies and the sort of conclusions that they got from them. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's a good question. So, and I'm familiar with the the critique. I haven't read deeply in it. Um, I, I'm sure you know, but you know, I, I I've been out of uh, out of direct research here for a few years. So I haven't been following all of these threads like I wish I could. Um, so yeah, there have been some issues with some of the early, like um, whether you want to call it diffusion of responsibility or the bystander effect that sort of goes by both names. One's the effect, the other is the, the theorized mechanism. And, and we can talk about that because I have obviously opinions on, on whether that's the mechanism or not. Um, some of the early research definitely had some issues. I read some of the critiques. That being said, I, and just to be really clear, I'm very much like I see all a lot of the problems that are in social psych. So it's not, like, I'm not one to dismiss like, oh no, you know, the foundation of this like stereotype threat seems, you know, as they've gone back and reanalyze it and keep pushing on it, ego depletions. So, like, so I'm no defender of, you know, old published stuff because it was published, but I, I would say two things. And, and again, I'm sure there's more on this, but we can, you know, like, like I'd have to go back into the literature again. Um, one is, what's interesting is that research, what we found out when we went to do our work, I went to do sort of the lit review for it. 
it sort of fell off like in like by like 1980 i think like the last review paper i found it was like late 70s i'm sure there's been you know a little bit here and there but as just a field of research it was almost like oh we solved this problem now people have picked it back up again in other areas um in, in sort of other forms and so uh again sort of a couple things one is from a game theoretic perspective and this is where sort of we come in and sort of see it like, oh, it's like an anti-coronation problem. From a game theoretic perspective, uh, technically what it is, is it's, it's known as a, what's called a volunteer's dilemma. Um, but more broadly, I think conceptually, it's easier to think of a threshold public goods game, right? So there's a bunch of people and any of us can donate, you know, we all got 10 bucks, we need to raise 40 to get a pizza. Right. And as soon as we get to that 40, like we're good, like everyone gets the pizza and there's no like there's no added benefit, you know, there's no, no continuous multiplier, it's just a threshold. And if we all have 10 bucks and there's 10 of us, we have 100 bucks. So who gives in? Do I'll give four dollars? Do you give 10 and I give zero? And so that kind of a scenario and that's how we would model it um, more specifically in the models that we are looking at. The, the predictions are very clear in the same way that they are for a lot of the other stuff. So one. I just want to say there, I, I do think there's actually good theoretical formal modeling under this in the game theory, even though, you know, the early research was very descriptive. So there's good theoretical reasons to, to see this and expect this. And we've seen it in some economic games uh, Two, I mean, we replicated it in our paper, the classic effect, and then make it sort of, you know, change with different levels of knowledge. And then three, like I said, what was really interesting to me is I, I think it deserves a revisit. Um, because as I said, when I went back to try and go through the literature, I sort of expected there'd be more than, you know, the textbook social psych chapter on, you know, it's, it's like a chapter in social psych and, you know, and, and it goes back and it's like, oh, yeah, so, you know, Darlene Laton found this. And then you look and you're like, oh, I, there really hasn't been much more since then. Um, and, you know, I went back and read the papers. I mean, I, I wasn't trying to pick through them in you know, all the methodological stuff, but I know that just a lot of that research had issues back then. So it's right to be picked back up. I think that it, it's, it, it's a very real effect. Unlike some of these other ones that seem to vanish once they you know, get more modern inquiry. Um, so I guess all of that, I wouldn't necessarily defend it, but I, I don't think it's uh, you know, an illusion of false positives or anything like that either. Mm -hmm. uh, so, with all of that in mind, what is then the bystander effect? What is the best way of understanding it? Yeah, so a bystander effect is, and it, uh, again, you can sort of model it formally, which is a very abstract, you know, like threshold public goods. I gave you a concrete example of, you know, we're going to get a pizza for $40. That makes it sort of simpler to understand. In an abstract sense, um, there's many things that could be could show this, but basically it's there's some scenario which requires individuals in the environment or in the situation to pay a cost so that they all sort of benefit together, right? Mm -hmm. But it it's not like a classic public goods game where like it all scales. Like if you get five bucks and I get five bucks, it all gets doubled and we get you know twice as much and we both get two fifty or whatever. Instead, it has that sort of threshold component. So somebody, you know falls on their bike and there's 50 of us around, it doesn't take all 50 people to go help them. In fact, it's kind of counterproductive, but it just takes maybe one or two. And so once that condition satisfied, I as a bystander don't have any like, great, the problem solved, that's best for me. I don't pay the cost and I get the benefit of not feeling bad later that I let this poor man you know, bleed on the sidewalk. And so Again, you can imagine a whole bunch of scenarios that take that and it could require two people to, you know, that threshold can be set in all kinds of ways. So it's fairly broad um, application um, generally. And then what's interesting about it, and, and again, if you, depend on how you define, I think, I feel like Moshe used to tell me this is not a word, but I, I you know, I read it, which is an anti-coordination game and an anti-coordination game. So in a coordination game, we all want to drive on the same side of the street, right? Um, an anti-coordination game, it's like the opposite. It's almost like if your two cars coming towards each other, if I'm on the right, you want to be on the left or vice versa. And that's also, so like the, you know, going back to the commitment stuff, that's also the game of chicken is like this, which is 
it, like worst case scenario, we both drive and crash, right? But my best case scenario is you swerve and I go straight, right? So you take one, you take option A and I take option B. My next best is we both swerve, right? And then my worst is I swerve and you, uh, and you go straight, right? Basically, I lose. Mm -hmm. So like either we both, you know, and you can sort of mentalize that. And so that is basically you want to do what the other person does. If you're going to go straight, I'm better to swerve than I am to go straight because we're going to crash. If you're going to swerve, I'm better to go straight because then I'm going to win as opposed to chickening out. And so that's what I mean by sort of like an anti-coordination game. And this bystander, uh, like the sort of bystander's dilemma or the bystander effect, it, it, it's situations that have that kind of property. Like if someone helps, that's all that's needed and we'd all prefer that it not be us, basically. Mm -hmm. Right. So let me just ask you about one last topic here. And I think that this also connects in a way with common knowledge. So what is indirect speech and what are its functions? Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, indirect speech is defined in pragmatic. It's basically when you, the literal meaning of the sentence is not the implied meaning, right? Mm -hmm. So, and there's a huge philosophy on this in, in philosophy and in, in cycling. I mean, it's all over the place. Um, and, and the real question is, and, and sort of where it comes from, I think it helps to set up like where it comes from because it, it's sort of in juxtaposition to that was, you know, back in like, like 60s when they're coming out with like the modern linguistics theories and especially the philosophy of language like Quine and so on, it seemed a lot about, oh, language is a medium for communicating information, right? In this like sort of factual way, like I tell you the sky is blue and you say, great, now I have another piece of information. And it was taken in this sort of straightforward way, almost like computers communicating with each other, which makes sense, you know, given the, the sort of what they're doing at the time. But since then, then it's puzzling. We don't really talk like that. So if you have this sort of, in fact, you know, if you're like trying to program computers and tell them what to do, you realize just how literal they can be. And we're like, oh, that's not what I meant. And so what's really clear is there's this whole other layer of stuff going on, like we're vague and indirect and, what we're doing is, you know, in, in, in like the, you know, linguistics of pragmatics is using the contextual cues of the environment, of the situation, of who I know you are, of our past shared history, so on and so on, in order to send meanings that aren't contained directly in the words themselves, right? So mm -hmm. classic example, um, and, and again, I'll, I'll sort of take the, the, the top example here that I think is intuitive. You go out for a date with someone who's been a friend for a while, right? So been friends for two years, went to school together. We finally go out on a date, but it's not quite clear, like, is it a date? And at the end of the night, you say, hey, do you want to come up, you know, you want to come up and watch a movie, right? Right. And given that it's, or even better, you want to come up for a cup of coffee and it's 2 a.m., right? No one drinks coffee at 2 a.m. Like, it could be blatantly transparent. You know what you're, you're saying, the, the, your partner might know what you're saying. You, you're like, I, can't, I don't know, they're probably not stupid. They probably know what I'm saying and know that I know that they know what they're saying. Um, but it's not actually like in the, in the statement itself, right? So literally I asked you a cup of coffee in that little wiggle room. Now, as much as we both might be 99.999% sure that like, I know what you meant, you know what I meant. I know that you know, you know, like, and so on. At some point, and, and this can be modeled more formally, but it, 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 it sort of unravels. So what it avoids is something that formally is called common P belief, which means if I'm 90% sure and I'm 90% sure that you you are, there's there's like mechanisms that kind of hold that. And I can give you, again, we actually have an experiment on this. I can give you like one concrete example because I didn't understand this for a while, which is, Okay, so we start with indirect speech. You want to come up for coffee. I think that's sort of clear that it's not like on the record blatant as opposed to if I say, hey, would you like to come up and have sex with me, right? Which is indisputable. Um, we basically did that by trying to create two different, basically there's two kinds of uncertainty that you can have. And this is a good juxtap juxtaposition with what we think indirect speech is doing. Mm -hmm. So one is 
you can still have without common odds, you can have what's called common P belief. And this is like if there's noise in the signal, right? So if I say, hey, do you want to come up and have sex with me, right, as a loud bus goes by and you get most of it, that basically still has the feed, like either you heard it or you didn't. If there's 90% chance you heard it. And again, you can, there's a lot of work Moshe did. You can kind of model like that is, you know, you, you the, the, the knowledge, the higher order knowledge doesn't decay. As opposed to the uncertainty created by ambiguity, when I say, you want to come up for a cup of coffee, because that ambiguity, it like, even if you're more sure, and, and we actually have data on this, I was sort of surprised we could get this effect, but we did exactly this. So we have data, like, if there's ambiguity, we could be equally sure of what the person just asked us. But if it's masked by noise, that sort of the higher order knowledge kind of is more robust than if I say, hey, do you want to you know, come up and watch a movie and the implications pretty clear, but not 100% certain? You get these kind of decays and we ask all these questions like how likely would you be able to maintain your friendship the next day? So again, just to sort of pump this intuition further, I, I think most people can imagine it's a good for, I mentioned it's a good friend for two years because there's already an existing equilibrium there, which is we're friends. You say, hey, do you want to come up and watch a movie? And even if you both know what happened, you know, it is politely declined. They go home. Next day, you can kind of all pretend it didn't happen. Versus if you say, hey, do you want to come up and have sex with me? Like, you can't. And the intuition is there. Like, oh, it, it's out there. Like, you, like, I can't take that back. And it's because you don't have that ambiguity creating that sort of layer of plausible deniability that causes the higher order levels of knowledge to unravel. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. Right. But, but uh, I mean, in terms of the functions that it serves, I mean, is there anything else you didn't mention? I mean, does it serve any specific concrete functions apart from perhaps the more obvious ones of the example you gave? Yeah, so um, the it, it actually has a, has a whole lot more functions. Um, and, and I sort of started this thread and I kind of jumped ahead, but originally one of the most prominent theories to explain indirect speech was politeness theory. And it was, mm -hmm. we use indirect speech as a way to basically communicate the message, but it's almost like you add another signal that comes through that message of like, I'm not imposing on you. So I say, um, hey, would you would you mind if I turn on the heat, right? Mm -hmm. Or like, when really I'm like, hey, turn on the heat. Or, you know, is it like your boss asks you, hey, can you, you know, come in and you're like, yeah, dude, you're my boss, like, you know, whatever. So there, and that certainly explains a lot of indirect speech. We do a lot of this, like, you know, like, oh man, some guacamole would be great right now. And it's, you know, across the table, that's a, a sort of politeness. And it's more or less like a, like you're adding sort of a layer of, of, of information to the communication itself, which is I'm trying to be polite and, you know, and, and we can get like that itself is kind of puzzling of like how that works that I think is interesting. But so there's a whole area of politeness that this absolutely, the models work there, there's tons of data on it, but there's just some cases where those models fall apart. And in particular, what defines those, like how you might separate those is sort of like, and again, broad brush, like generally speaking, in the kinds of scenarios I'm talking about, there's a potential conflict of interest, right? You might want to be lovers and I want to be friends or vice versa, right? Or I'm threatening you, right? Like you don't want to hear the threat if possible. And I wanted to get through, but I don't want other people to hear. So the in these scenarios where there's these sort of entrenched conflicts of interest specifically around the communication not just generally that's mm -hmm. where you tend to see this more strategic indirect speech and in fact it's not perceived as more polite like wow i'd love some guacamole you know if you ask people to rate that they'll say oh yeah that's more polite than saying like give me the guacamole but it, 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 instead, it, it, it's rated as less polite or even threatening or mean, depending on the, the context in which, like, is it a threat or is it, you know, uh, a bribe? Is it a, you know, sexual proposition and so on? Right. So, I mean, just before we go, would you like to mention any other, I mean, good example of uh, a, a specific case or context where common knowledge applies? I mean, things that we haven't talked about. Yeah, so it's, 
It's a great question, and I'm going to give you a more general answer than one specific one. Um, if you want a bunch of specific examples, I'd refer folks to the end of the discussion of the 2014 Psychology of Coordination and Common Knowledge paper, where we list off like 20. And then there's more recently, there's a PNAS review um, in which we, we sort of go through evidence for, I don't know, three or four of the ones we've had the chance to test out of that list. So there's a ton of them, and I could just give you, you know, the laundry list of things. But I think more generally, what, what the, the way that I think about it and, and what, sort of what I leave you with is kind of where we started, which is where there are coordination problems, you should expect these kinds of common knowledge effects. And where you sort of see common knowledge effects, you should be looking for what is the coordination problem. And as all mathematic, well, not all, but as mathematical constructs tend to be, the sort of formalisms themselves, they don't have content, right? They're not about speech or about bombing. They're about how numbers behave according to specific rules. And so much like sort of pi, you know, the number pi seems to pop up everywhere because of these underlying mathematical isomorphisms in the way that rivers work and the way that circles work and the way that sine waves work, right? So they have sort of these shared formal properties. I, I like where this list of, of sort of somewhat seemingly unrelated stuff comes from, like market bubbles, uh, you know, diffusion of responsibility, like we talked about a lot with social norms and pluralistic ignorance, I think as a component to the evolution of leadership and followership, it's important in negotiation and bargaining, international relations, like group mass movements, um, on and on, you know, arbitrary rules of etiquette and, and like, I, like I could just keep going. And what those all share is it's domains that have this kind of property of there's some sort of coordination. There's multiple ways that we can coordinate our behavior and whether it's through speech or through me not volunteering or through me giving charitably or for me blushing, what underlies all those, they seem sort of unconnected is they all have some kind of coordination problem that's sitting sort of underneath. Great. So where can people find you on the internet? Um, I, I have an old website uh, that's, I, well, actually, I probably shouldn't recommend that because I, I, I sort of just let it fall apart. It's not very interesting anymore. I, it was at the end of my, my PhD. Um, so I'm on Twitter, at SurfKT, uh, at, like surf, like surfing, KT. Um, although I don't have much of an online presence, so I, I, I lurk a lot on Twitter. But you won't see me post a whole lot unless sometimes I get excited about kind of random stuff. Um, but other than that, I, I mean, that's pretty much my only online social presence at the moment. I guess I got a LinkedIn profile. <laughs> you can check that out, but it's not very exciting. <laughs> okay, so Dr. Thomas, thank you a lot for coming on the show. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Yeah, thanks. It's been my pleasure as well. Hi guys, thank you for watching the interview until the end. Please do not forget to support the show. It's thanks to people like you that it keeps running. So you have links in the description box to Patreon and PayPal. For even just $1 per month, you can support the show and get access to all the goodies I have to for you in Patreon. Uh, and you also have links to PayPal, of course. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share the interview, leave a like and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzkan, Blanchett Pearl, Larson, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford and Frederick Sunda. Ricardo Vladimir, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingbord, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Eric Alenius, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Miller, Herbert Kintis, Rutger Voss, Bo Weingard, Rebecca Newburger Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegger, Rui Nassio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Thomas Trumbull, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Sandrubano, Simon Colombo, Jorge Spinha, Phil Cavana, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Mikkel Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Yugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Omri Hickson, Fergal Cusson, Evan Bodrenko, Al Herzog, 
Don Ross, Jonathan Lybrand, Oslan Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Weira, Tom Hummel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Desaraújo, Eden Solon, Roman Roach, Dmitry Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punter, Adana Rusmani, Charlotte Bliss, Miran B, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostazewski, Max Bailby, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Elman, João Linhares, Lida Cosmidi, Saima Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, my producers, Isar Webb, Jim Frank, Lucas Stafiniak, Ian Gilligan, Sérgio Quadriano, Luis Caetano, Tom Venegnam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Guidi, Sardas France, and Niruban Balachandran, and my executive producers, Michel Rugieski, Rosie, James Pratt, and Matthew Lavender. Thank you for all.